a great pleasure for me, uh, a, a real pleasure, to introduce um, both uh, Ben Salem Hamish and Roger Allen, sitting behind me, who are going to have a conversation about translation, specifically around uh, the latest uh, uh, collaboration between the two men, which resulted in a Muslim suicide, about the title of which uh, it will be only be one of the topics of conversation. Um, those of you who've read the, uh, the, the afterword will know what that's all about. In any case, it's a, it is uh, a volume which won, and deservedly won, the uh, Seif Khubash Banipal Prize. I think I've got the title of the prize right. Roger? Yes. <laughs> it is the Banipal Mrs. Prize, which Mrs. it's known by. Um, and it was the year that uh, Humphrey Davis was runner-up for uh, another volume, which is no mean achievement to make Humphrey Davis the runner-up. He's an <laughs> another great, great uh, translator. Um, so now that I've shown you what this book looks like and, and what the title is, I just want to tell you that it, there are about 14 copies outside. So after the event, I think both uh, uh, gentlemen will be willing to, to sign copies that are purchased. Um, let me put that down and introduce, first of all, uh, Ben Salim Hamish, who, as you all know, uh, I always feel uh, introducing someone is almost a bit of an OTOS exercise because you come to hear someone that you want to... Uh, um, you come to hear someone speak because you know their reputation, if you know, you know something about them. In any case, it's, um, it is really a great honor to, to introduce one of the, the, without a doubt, leading uh, novelists and intellectuals and thinkers and uh, uh, historians of in, in, the, in the Middle East. Um, ben Salim Hamish is Moroccan. As you know, um, he was born in Meknes in 1949. Um, now, he's published 11 novels and four collections of poetry, as well as numerous books of essays and criticism. Uh, he, he writes in both Ara Arabic and French, but he's declared to me this evening that he will speak in English. Um, his novel, The, the Theocrat, Majnun al-Hukm, won the Narket Award, uh, the Riyadh Reyes Prize, that is, and was chosen by the Authors' Union in Egypt as one of the best novels of the 20th century. Um, he won the great Atlas Prize for his novel, Al Alema, the, which was translated as the Polymath, um, as well as the prestigious Nagib Mahfouz Medal for Literature in 2001. That is to say that um, both the great Atlas and the Mahfouz Medal were awarded uh, to that novel, which is about Ibn Khaldun. So we already started to sense that uh, uh, Ben Salim Hamish is interested in historical figures, though I think he would debate the fact that his, uh, of whether or not the, the novels that he writes are historical novels. Um, his novel, Mu'adhibati, My Tormentor, was shortlisted for the 2012 International Prize for Arabic Fiction, and A Muslim Suicide uh, was nominated for the, uh, for the same prize a year earlier, but then subsequently won the prize uh, for the best translation. Um, he is professor of philosophy at Muhammad uh, five University, Mohammed V University in Rabat, and was Minister of Culture of Morocco from 2009 to 2012. Um, welcome, uh, Ben Salim Hamish. Let me say a brief word. I can't say a brief word about Roger Allen. Uh, let me say a word about Roger Allen. I've deliberately not mentioned, um, of course, who was the translator of the four novels of ben, Sal uh, ben Salim Hamish. For those of us who don't know Arabic, we are uh, confined to reading his, his um, Majnun al-Hukm, The Theocrat, the, uh, the Polymath, Muslim Suicide, and My Tormentor in English um, in the translations of uh, Roger Allen. Roger Allen is, I think, um, and I think everybody in my field thinks, uh, the most distinguished, certainly one of the most distinguished scholars of modern Arabic literature. In fact, Arabic literature to court in the Anglophone uh, academic sphere, which, in fact, the academic sphere globally. He, he um, did something which no one did in, in his day as a student, which is that he studied modern Arabic literature when no one knew what that was at Oxford. In uh, 1966, I think he went up to Oxford didn't want to read nothing but Ibn Khaldun and decided to read some modern Arabic literature when Muhammad Badawi was, the was appointed as 
um, lecturer in modern Arabic literature at the time. And since uh, he got his PhD in 68, I think he's been teaching ever since at uh, Penn University uh, for 43 years. Um, there's a story behind that, which you might tell, but anyway. Um, so uh, he is, I would say there are three aspects of his work that you should, you should know about. First, his, his commitment to Arabic pedagogy uh, is, is, is not really second to his interest in literature. He's, he's written about Arabic pedagogy and always taught Arabic whilst teaching literature. Whilst teaching literature, I must say, at, at the highest level uh, of, of theoretical uh, uh, frameworks. Um, he's well known for his work on the novel, the modern Arabic novel. Uh, uh, the Arabic novel, a historical and critical introduction, is on every reading list uh, 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 that any undergraduate and even graduate reads. He's famous, of course, for his um, wonderful book on Mwailihi, which is a translation of Mwailihi's third edition of Isa ibn Hisham, Fatr ibn Zaman. And um, I'm very pleased to say that he's actually doing a, um, a complete edition of Mwailihi uh, for the Library of Arabic Literature in a parallel text edition. Um, there's a, a remarkably detailed and interesting story behind that. So lots of stories. Um, um, hiding under the surface. But of course, Roger, as well as being a teacher of Arabic, uh, a scholar of Arabic, uh, his other great work is, the, is the, uh, his um, Arabic literary heritage, which is a sort of a tour de force tour, in, a, in another sense, uh, of uh, the Arabic literary tradition from pre-Islamic Arabia to uh, the, uh, the most contemporary literature. But he's well known as um, a a translator and collaborator with authors. He has done some wonderful translations of Rangi Mahfouz, whom he knew very well. And uh, he knows I'm always very envious of how well he knew Mahfouz. He translated uh, Karnak, Autumn Quail, uh, God's World was the first one, which was a collection of short stories. But the, the most wonderful, let me just be personal about it, the one that I think is a real a gem is Mirrors. That's my personal favorite. And I say that because not many people read Mirrors, which is of course, Nagib Mahfouz's Maraya. I think if you can get a copy of that in the wonderful edition with Saif Wanli's uh, illustrations, then you're doing yourself a great favor. And of course, the other great collaboration, as well as, I mean, he's, he's translated Jabra Ibrahim Jabra uh, and, and other authors, uh, Abdul Hamid Munif, of course, and uh, Yusuf Idris. But the other great collaboration is with Ben Salim Hamish, which we're here to in part celebrate and discuss today. He translated, I think, first Majnun al Hukm, the theocrat, then Al Alama, and then Hadh al Andalusi, this Andalusian, which was translated as a Muslim suicide, um, as well as the Mu fourth one. Yeah, Mu'adibati, yeah. Mu yes, of course. So this is another uh, a great um, collaboration. We're, we're, we're very honored to have you here, very pleased to have you here, and I'll just get off the stage. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. I'm told the, the subject tonight is Salim uh, Hamesh and translation. I just have to say that uh, throughout my career, one of the great privileges I have had as a translator conforms with the principle that I have, which is I don't like to translate anybody, particularly who writes novels, unless I have a personal relationship with them. This has allowed me to meet and to get to know a, an astonishing panoply of the best writers of Arabic novels. Uh, Professor Kennedy mentioned some of them. Nagib Mahfouz, Yusuf Idris, Jabra, Ibrahim Jabra, Abdurrahman Munif, Maytel Misani, Hanan al-Sheikh, Salim Hamish, Ahmad Tawfiq, and most recently, Ibrahim al Kouni. So I really have had the opportunity to engage with an incredible cross-section of the genius of modern Arabic fiction and to engage in the process of translation. I'd like to spend a few entirely boring minutes talking to you about translation and translators before I proceed to talk about the specific novel uh, 
are most of them suicide. I begin my talking about literary translation because in spite of the best efforts of many American universities and their tenure committees, I am firmly of the opinion that literary translation is the highest possible skill of the literary scholar. And it's extremely dangerous to ask anybody who's not a literary scholar to indulge in literary translation. I, I make a distinction here between literary translation and literal translation. I'd suggest to you probably that literal translation doesn't exist. Namely, if I say to you, Yumtur, Qutat, Wal Kilab, that I think is a fairly exquisitely accurate translation of its reigning cats and dogs. But while that may work in the English cultural context, uh, it certainly doesn't work in the Arabic context. And that of course, is a reflection of the fact that translation, and I'm afraid I'm an ex-classic scholar, so I indulge in these boring etymologies. Translation is the act of carrying something across. Translation. What's being carried across is not merely language, but it's cultural value. And in the current framework of post-colonial studies, translation becomes particularly interesting because of the dimensions of cultural hegemony seen in particular policies that are made with regard to translation. One which particularly interests me is the process of translating names and particularly place names. What is the impact, one wonders, of the fact that the second volume of the great Thulathiya or trilogy of Nagib Mahfouz in Arabic is called Qasr al-Shawq which is the name of a street in Cairo. But in English, Palace of the Desire evokes all sorts of images of the Thousand One Nights and exoticism and so on. So, uh, alternatively expressed, when was the last time in English we heard about a street in Paris called the Elysian Fields? And if we don't hear about the Elysian Fields, what does that say about overt or covert assumptions about cultural hegemony. Literary translation, then, is a maximal act of interpretation, and it has to be, if the transfer process is to achieve in the target culture some of what the original text achieves in the source culture. Translation is also expansive. As I'm discovering in preparing the text for the Library of Arabic Literature series, where the fact that, of course, it's a parallel text, in other words, the English is on one side and the Arabic's on the other, implies certain limitations on the amount of expansion that the translator can indulge in. As Umberto Eco has shown in a wonderful book, which I recommend you, called Mouse or Rat which is a study of translation. It's also unidirectional. In other words, in this book, Umberto Eco takes one sentence from his famous novel, The Name of the Rose, and translates the English version into Italian. He then takes that Italian and retranslates it into English. He then takes that English and converts it back into Italian. He does this six times. And by the time you get to the end, the, it's, it's rather like that process, you know, of telling somebody a joke and sharing it round a circle and coming back and seeing what the joke sounds like at the end. In other words, you, you can't retranslate, uh, particularly, I'm talking primarily about literary texts here. I'm not talking about mechanical translation of two plus two equals four, which I'll admit probably is translatable without necessarily a massive act of interpretation. Um, I move on now to talk a little bit about translators, because while I don't expect you to get out your handkerchiefs and weep tears, um, the status of translators is, in some cases, quite problematic, uh, particularly for literature scholars. There are a variety of contexts within which translation may occur. The bulk of translation activity occurs with individual 
translators probably working, as I do, with uh, authors, and particularly fruitfully in this case, with my wonderful friend and colleague, uh, Ben Salem Hamish. Uh, I've also translated with a second translator who is frequently an Arabic native speaker and have interesting discussions, particularly the two translations of Jabra Ibrahim Jabra that I did were done with a, a second uh, translator. One of my most memorable experiences was based in the wonderful Spanish, previously Islamic city of Toledo, which, as you, as you may or may not know, is the center of the European Center for Translation, based in the very building that was the place where Archbishop Raymond founded the famous school of translation in that particular city. This was a project called Memoir de la Mediterranée, or the Kerit al in Arabic, where, uh, under the aegis of the European Cultural Foundation, a decision was made by a committee to translate the same work of autobiography or memoir into six languages, six different languages, simultaneously in the presence of the author as well. This, of course, was a fascinating experience in, in cultural transfer. The one which I translated in this series was by a young Egyptian named May Termisani. The novel was called Dunya Zad. And among the languages involved, in addition to my English, were Italian, French, Catalan, Spanish, and Russian. So each of the translators was present there and was talking about the problems of transferring the Arabic into that particular language. One of the features, of course, that we're addressing now is the increasing presence of prizes awarded to translation and the different circumstances involved in that process and the way in which the translators are involved or not. Some of the translation prizes, such as the Saif Rabash Prize, which I was honored to win with the novel uh, A Muslim Suicide, uh, replicate the procedures used, for example, um, with the King Fahd Prize at the University of Arkansas, namely that it's a decision made on the basis of not only the translation, but the comparison of the translation with the original. In other cases, the original text is not involved at all. And there's the question about whether the resulting text, the target text, is a worthy contributor to whatever literary genre it may be. One of the most fascinating things for me in the translation process is what translation theory calls the intertextual stage. In other words, what exactly is the process whereby the translator goes through the process? And it's here that I regularly invoke the renowned uh, German philosopher, theologian, and translator, Friedrich Schleiermacher. And thanks to the wonderful theoretician of translation, who happens to be a professor in my own city of Philadelphia, namely Lawrence Venuti, I can quote to you one thing which Schleiermacher has to say. Either, or either, <laughs> the translator leaves the author in peace as much as possible and moves the reader towards him, <clears throat> or else he leaves the reader in peace and moves the author towards him. In other words, the question is, in translation, are you domesticating the text or are you foreignizing the reader? This, of course, takes us directly into the process of the reception of translation, translations. And I mean by that not only the practical aspect of marketing and perceived readerships, and believe me, as a translator, I can tell you that publishers in the Western world are maximally concerned about markets and readerships. Edward Said has a wonderful quote, which you may know if you've read any of his, um, the, uh, not his 
major works, but the collections of his essays, which were put together later. The New York publisher who said that they couldn't publish any works of Arabic literature because Arabic was a controversial language. Uh, I don't think I need to comment any further on that. But this process of reception is a problematic area. And I'd like to focus on two particular issues here. The firstly f takes the form of a quotation from a Swedish comparative literature scholar named Horace Engdahl. Now, the fact that she's a Swedish comparative literature scholar might not necessarily be totally relevant, apart from the fact that he happens to be the secretary of the Swedish Academy, which awards the Nobel Prize. There is a powerful literature in all big cultures. But you can't get away from the fact that Europe is still the center of the literary world, not the United States. The US is too isolated and too insular. They don't translate enough and don't really participate in the big dialogue of literature. That ignorance is restraining. Wow. <clears throat> but I can go back and talk to you also about another characteristic about marketing and translation. I and others have written recently about the phenomenon in the Arabic-speaking world of the increasing bestseller category. One of the most notorious of these texts is a work called Banat Riyadh. I don't know if any of you have read it. If you have, I sympathize. Here is what the translator of the text into English has to say. The translator is my wonderful esteemed colleague, Marilyn Booth, a, also a major translator of Arabic texts into English. Perhaps the largest scandal, however, is that for some publishers and writers, literary translators remain derivative servitors rather than creative artists. A notion fostered by a long tradition within Euro-American letters of the writer as solitary genius, except, alhamdulillah, Salem is certainly not a solitary genius. I can vouch for that. And translation is a mechanical exercise now enhanced by the star system of today's publishing businesses. That the press and author of this work, Penguin Books, no less, did not take my professionalism seriously or listen to my warnings that their choices would lead to an inferior and infelicitous project will not come as a surprise to any translators. So, <clears throat> the translation process, as we know, is a maximal act of interpretation. It involves making decisions regarding every kind of aspect of the transfer process, style, cultural context, uh, the format of the resulting text, particularly where the cultures are fairly dif different from each other. Now, <clears throat> turning specifically to the Moroccan novel, and particularly the novels of Salem Hamish, I have to note that uh, as I read out that list of uh, authors with whom I've worked and whom I've translated, you may have noticed an initial concentration on the mashriq, on writers from what we'll call the Middle East, although quite what the Middle East is, nobody knows, which is probably just as well. <clears throat> uh, but it was after the publication of a volume of the Cambridge History of Modern Arabic Literature, the one edited by my esteemed supervisor, Mustafa Badawi, when some of my colleagues 
from the Maghrib pointed out that the entire history of Arabic literature project of Cambridge basically ignores the Maghrib entirely. There is a separate volume on Andalus, but that is not quite the same thing. And one really wonders geographically whether that makes much, extent, much sense in the history of Arabic literature in any case. But I simply want to say, by way of preface here uh, to discussing the, the novels of Salim Hamish, that I made a conscious decision about 15 years ago to put behind me the ongoing concern with Egypt as Umar Dunya and everything else which Egyptians like to say about Egypt, and to actually concentrate on writings in the Maghrib, and particularly on writings in Arabic in Morocco. And I'd hasten to say that while I am aware of the wonderfully rich Francophone tradition of Morocco, I am primarily concerned with the Arabo Arabophone tradition of Morocco. In this context, I have to suggest as I've suggested in several venues, that in claiming, as many of us do now, to be experts on something called modern Arabic literature, that while I may have been able to get away with that claim when I started in 1964, the expansion of every aspect of culture in the region from the ocean to the Gulf, to quote Abdel Nasser, is such that it is no longer possible to claim to be an expert on everything. And indeed, there is a great need now for a much different kind of specialization. I'm not necessarily talking about geography. I may be talking about literary genre. I may be talking about critical approach. It doesn't matter what it is. But to try and say that you can quote, cover, unquote, everything just simply doesn't hold up any longer, at least as far as I'm concerned. I say this particularly in this venue, because if there is one major area that needs much more attention from scholarship, and particularly Anglophone scholarship, it is the emerging literature of the Gulf region, which has been scantily covered, to put it uh, politely. But I have, as it were, moved in the other direction, away from the central regions, as 19th century Orientalists might call it, to the west, which is what Maghrib means, after all. <coughs> the process of translating the novels of Selim Hamish uh, began when we encountered each other in Cairo at one of the many conferences organized by al Maglis al-A'la uh, which at that time was headed by one of the colleagues whom we both know and respect greatly, uh, Professor uh, Gaber Asfour, who was then the Director General of that organization, the Supreme Cul Council for Culture. And I have to say, quite frankly, that Gaber Asfour and that particular institution in Cairo has been, so far, the only pan-Arab organization that has tried to get together intellectuals from not only across the Arab world, but Europe, the United States, and fascinating for me, East Asia, holding discussions with Wei Li, the professor of Arabic at Shanghai, in Arabic, was one of my most incredibly interesting and revelatory experiences. Firstly, to know that there is somebody doing the same thing as I am in Shanghai. Why wouldn't he be? But that actually he is there along with the rest of us in Cairo and that we're all engaged to a certain extent on the same endeavor. It was there that um, I picked up a copy of Majnun al hukm and while I'm not going to go into the process of translating that, I do have to say that already some of the issues regarding translation came to the fore. Because one of the, you may not, I, perhaps you do realize this, and perhaps maybe we want to talk about this. One of the major issues about publication of translations is 
the title and the cover. Now, those of you who know the French scholar Gérard Genette will know all about his uh, study of paratexts. In other words, everything other than what's contained within the covers, the blurb on the back, the cover, the title, etc. These are not insignificant issues. Um, I wanted to call Majnun al hukm power crazy, which seemed to me to be an apt reflection of what the novel was about. It's about one of Islam and Shia Islam's most notorious and famous figures, the Fatimi Caliph al-Hakim bi Amrullah, who historians would suggest certainly had significant uh, mental issues. Uh, but the American University in Cairo Press didn't like that title. And it came out eventually as The Theocrat, which is sort of OK, but doesn't seem to me in any way to capture the meaning and the significance of Majnoon al-Hukm. Uh, so there is a, a concrete example right at the beginning of my relationship with Salim Hamish. Now, it was when um, I was translating the second of these novels, Al-Allama, that, that came across fairly easily. In other words, my translation of that is polymath. Seems to be fairly close to what the Arabic seems to be implying, and certainly fairly close to the status that Ibn Khaldun, the great theoretician of history, the role he plays in the, the history of not merely Islamic thought, but Western thought as well. Allegedly, the pioneer in the, uh, in the preparation of a social scientific methodology, if you like, a, a more synchronic uh, view of history, getting away from a more analytic approach. It was while I was translating that that Salim Hamish and I again met in Cairo. And he knew that I was translating this. and. He has this habit of, of doing this whenever we meet, which is that he tells me what he's doing next. And he told me, I'm, trans I'm doing a new novel. And he said, this new novel is about Ibn Sab'in. Now, I didn't know anything about Ibn Sab'in at that point, but uh, I've since learned rather a lot by translating th this particular novel. And he said to me, uh, I've decided to entitle it Al-Intihar bi Jawar al-Kaaba, which is translated, I suppose, as uh, suicide um, alongside, or something like that, bi Jawar, uh, the, the Kaaba. And I said, that's a very catchy title indeed. Um, but I'm not sure maybe whether that's going to fly particularly well in certain segments of the Arabic-speaking market. I just uh, made that suggestion and um, didn't take any further part. And then when I was sent a copy of this particular work, I look at the cover and see that it's now called Hadal Andalusi. So perhaps my cautionary words uh, may have had some effect, I don't know, but certainly um, I proceeded to translate it and I sent it to Salim Hamish and said, I've chosen the title This Man from Spain as a title. Fairly close to Hadal Andalusia, not too bad, unless you want this Andalusian or something like that, but fairly close. And he wrote back immediately and said, I don't like that. And this is, by the way, in anticipation of a regularly asked question regarding this work, is to how could I, as the translator, offer such a radically different title than the one in Arabic? The answer, of course, is it's not radically different, and that the title, A Muslim Suicide, is the personal choice of its author. In other words, going back precisely 
to the original title he had in mind, uh, but that he didn't wish to use or that somebody didn't wish to use in its Arabic context, but that the Western version of it indeed would replicate that. Welcome to some of the issues regarding the translation and uh, the process of marketing and publication. Salim Hamish has written a number of novels, and he will insist, quite rightly, that they're not all of them, or perhaps they're not any of them, historical novels. This replicates, of course, the writings of the great Hungarian critic uh, Lukács, Georg Lukács, who in, a no who in a book called The Historical Novel notes that he's not convinced at all that there are things called historical novels. That, in fact, there are novels which may treat history, but in a certain sense, every novel either is or becomes historical. Uh, Dickens is historical, representative of his time. Jane Austen is certainly historical, a representative of her time. Naguib Mahfouz, above all. I've written articles pointing out that the trilogy goes from 1916 to 1944. It's in the book. You can read it. So, yes, it's historical. And what about Habibi's al waqa al Gharib, Emil Habibi, which is very specifically divided up into segments based on the Palestinian experience. And that the, the last segment of al waqa al Gharib is the post-1967 period. The others are pre-67. So, Salim Hamish would insist, and I would agree, writes novels. Now, it so happens that the three that I've translated and published so far are all about figures from Islamic history. And they make use of a variety of different kinds of texts, some of them actual texts drawn from historians, others of them pastiches of texts. This, of course, belongs to a trend which we see beginning, perhaps, in the post-67 period with Jamal al-Ghitani and his Zaini Barakat, which is available, incidentally, for those of you interested in it, in a wonderful English translation by my now regrettably late colleague Farouk Mustafa of Chicago. This, of course, makes the translation process that much more complex because you have to decide on particular levels of style to be used according to the nature of the text which you are currently dealing with. And that the texts are not all the same. One of the major challenges of a Muslim suicide is the fact that this amazing character, Ibn Sab'in, so-called because he had, in his original city of Murcia, 70 devotees. Uh, his real name is Ibn, uh, Ibn Dara al-Andalusi. I, I wonder, um, uh, it, it's fascinating, he is born in exactly the same city, Murcia, as Ibn al-Arabi, perhaps an even more famous name. And I, I, I'm, I'm led to ask myself, what, what is it about the water in Murcia that produces some of the most amazing thinkers in the entire history of Islam? Some of the major, radical, heterodox thinkers who really challenge some of the orthodox bases uh, prevalent at the time. And what interests me is one of the authors who Salim Hamish quotes at the end is none other than Ibn Taymiyyah, seen perhaps as one of the more, the more major figures in the process of uh, trying to rein in the more radical ideas of certain Muslim thinkers. 
So translating a Muslim suicide was a huge challenge in terms of the variety of texts involved. Halfway through his life and his journey from Murcia to Mecca, and yes, the historical record shows that when he is challenged by a Zahir Baybars, extremely fundamentalist in his views, he waits till Zahir Baybars has performed the Hajj to Mecca, then he says, okay, and he goes to the Kaaba and commits suicide at a very early age. That is part of the historical record. But the, the process of dealing with these different phases in his life is most represented by the fact that his primary devotee is one of the most famous Sufi poets writing in Arabic, namely Ashushtari. And believe me, translating Ashushtari's ecstatic verse into English really was a major test of the translation exercise. I just want to finish before I let the pr primary author talk here by saying that uh, I've also now translated another novel. And it's in the context of that that I want to make it clear that Salim Hamish is a novelist. He writes novels of all kinds. Mu'adhibati, which for which we've just been discussing this, I have coined a non-existent English term, my torturess, is an account of the extraordinary rendition. I don't know if you're familiar with that term. It's a rather nasty phrase, uh, uh, rather like termination with extreme uh, uh, it, pre uh, prejudice which was during the Vietnam War for killing somebody. Extraordinary rendition is the process whereby certain members of uh, certain inhabitants of Middle Eastern societies were rendered, meaning flown, to black sites, to various prisons where they were tortured. And this is the subject of this highly controversial novel, and I will be very interested to see what happens if and when it is published in English, because it will stand to be, when it's published, probably one of the very first works of fiction to actually address itself to this subject, which has rather been swept under a rug. Um, so, by the way, um, Salem Hamish this morning gave me a copy of his latest novel, uh, and uh, I haven't read it yet, but I will, and we'll see w what that means. But um, I, I hope this has been something of an introduction to the, the problems of translation itself, the status of translators, the com complex situation in which translators work now, which, which is, it, it, it's complicated, but I think it's also exciting. It does have its frustrations, particularly when you're dealing with publishers, I will confess. Not uh, the Library of Arabic Literature, I hasten to looking at Phil, um, but um, trying to publish certain novels in the context of assessments about what publishers think that readers in particular Western cultures are prepared to negotiate with. I will simply say again what I said, quoting uh, from Schleiermacher, that nobody reads a translated work to be presented with the familiar. And if they do, they probably should read Danielle Steele or Judith Krantz or somebody else instead. The process of reading a translation from a foreign literature is and should be a confrontation with the unfamiliar. It should be a confrontation with difficulty. Uh, quoting the Russian formalists about poetry, perhaps. But if it's not that, then what's the purpose of it in this uh, increasingly multicultural global society and in the context within the post-colonial period of attempts to dominate one culture with another? And with that uh, subversive thought, I will 
now stop and hand over to Salem Hamish. Uh, allow me in the beginning to express um, many thanks uh, to amiable invitation from uh, New York University, Doha, uh, Abu Dhabi Institute, and especially to his uh, honorable director, Mr. Philip uh, Kennedy. As uh, you know, uh, my Hada uh, al-Andalusi, or uh, a Muslim society, it's a problematic uh, <laughs> a title. Uh, this, uh, this novel, this novel has uh, uh, been awarded uh, by Saif uh, Gobash uh, Banipal last year, uh, translated by uh, this uh, professor and, and uh, a dear friend, Rosie Allen. This is a uh, gesture and uh, esteem for uh, an excellent specialist, specialist of uh, an Arabic uh, literature and uh, Celebrated, celebrated translator of the best Arabic novels. Uh, thanks and uh, congratulations for him. Uh, I must uh, say uh, s some words about this personal, uh, very exceptional, very, very extraordinary. Abdul Haq ibn Sabain, born only uh, three days after the crushing uh, Al Muhad and uh, defeat at uh, Las Navas de Tolosa in uh, 1220. Abdul Haq ibn Sabain of Murcia, in, uh, Spanish, Andalusia was uh, to live, live only the second phase of the rule of the Taifas King List. A rule punctuated, uh, punctuated by uh, sporadic Muslim, uh, Marinid, jewels that we are, that were uh, limited and uh, ephemeral. A powerless uh, witness of uh, a depressive temporality and uh, of the irreparable loss embodied in the agony of Al Andalus and in the sharp and repeated prod of the Iberian Reconquista. Ibn Sabin will lay the on an uh, unstable and uh, tormented life, a life reflecting a profoundly hurt for where, where Martin, uh, morning collective uh, psyche. His name is uh, a pseudonym, meaning son of 17. Number which, uh, in relation to ancient Arabic alphabet, means the lunar circle, just has his other surname of Ibn Dara. The notice a valiant knees, chevalier. As far as he is concerned, all these reigns with uh, a man who wears around himself and around others to the point of conservative nausea and loss of consciousness. Hence, uh, his uh, aversion for 
all kinds of vile and decadent people. And his ardent desire to continually transcend himself. It is from this state of man also that we can explain his total lack of adjustment and his acute sense of cherio, cherios, curo, and internal life. As a campion of psychological criticism, Ibn Sab'in resorted to the sharpest polemics, not even sparting the most illustrious names in Islamic philosophy. In an environment rather hostile to criticism, he dared affirm that Averroes had a passion for Aristoteles, Aristotle. Adored by his fervent disciple, Abu Hassan al-Shushari, the master of the errant. Ibn Sab'in was the contrary, execrated by a good number of theologians, theologians and Jewish councils and hunted wherever he traveled. However, in Sota, where he was asked in marriage by a woman who was both beautiful, beautiful and rich, he managed to write uh, most of his work for an entire decade, decade under the protective wings of the governor Ibn Khalas. Mm -hmm. After that, after that, he was forced to resume his escape for Buji, Bujaya, to Cairo via Tunis to reach Mecca at last and they put himself under the protection of the governor of that city, the Sharif Ibn Numay. And there in this cast of, of a sanctuary and the meditation, he spent much time in the Hira Grot. Where the Prophet of Islam received his uh, first revelation, waiting for whatever sign would come uh, to him from God or his angel Gabriel. The problem was that in Mecca, the persisted in uh, Wielding his Hellenism. Will in the name of his existential monism, Wahdat al Wujud, he still believed in the pantheistic nature that caught all, all that is uh, order, separates us from the one. The one is a good. And all that separated is an imperfect and painful things. As I re uh, remedy, he uh, thought there was only one way to follow, that of God, which is also the way toward the self. For him, the active being or intellectual is, in a sense, 
an absolute and individual continuum. So, one day, at the age of the 56, and the sacred space around the Kaaba, he committed harakiri, he committed suicide by uh, uh, slitting his vines, an act of sacrilege of ever there was one which in all probab probability was not motivated by personal considerations, but more likely sprang out of the ineradicable desire of our Pontheist to hasten his union with God, which in this world of sound and fury was too slow to happen. Little given to uh, wordness, Ibn Sabin left us only our doctrinal work, Buddha Arif, the necessary knowledge, knowledge, the necessary knowledge, and the several letters or epistles of which a few include answers to question from the King Sicily, the future German, German Emperor Frederick II, a friend of Islam and an ad adversary of Roma Papacy, of Wom Nietzsche, Frederick Nietzsche, an adversary of Roma, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, would the latter says he is on uh, Frederick II, he is one of two of whom I am nearest. Any conclusion? More generally, when uh, I, am, I uh, entered the uh, real of uh, fiction, I saw myself sitting up uh, at, at two prominent poles, two poles, two poles, no more. The philosophical pole, the philosophical pole attachment to the individual, but not to individualism. Uh, there is a big difference between individual, individualism, individualism. Is, uh, what spurred me on the level or writing to under understand the expressive possibilities of the novel and its uh, communicative usefulness. Fiction allows the creation and the characters and the narrative unfolding of their life trajectories through the uh, fabric and relations and intrigues, intrigues in weave they are embedded in more than one way i find in the novel strong semantic taste weave in formal philosophy revolving around existence and the being. It process, processes the most fertile grounds uh, for reflection and human issues in uh, its liminal manifestations. The novel relates fundamentally to modes of meaning or their absence. In uh, the dialectic of life and the death. Finally, the second, uh, the, the last uh, uh, poll, I, I see everything as heritage. Everything. That is as a story for even 
what we produce today will be one day transformed into heritage. Like uh, all historical systems, the heritage itself is exposed to changing times and to the test of persistence and survival. Some works become uh, prominent as their extraordinary inner drive provides uh, them with uh, a force that uh, catapults them beyond their time and the place. Synchro Nicali, they uh, exist, uh, exist on a level whose depth and uh, extent every knowledge jebel writes rec recognizes, namely their, their uh, a tempora, a temporal contemporaneity on this level, varied aspect of creativity from all culture and epoch mates. Uh, I am very, very sorry uh, if uh, my pronunciation is uh, not uh, uh, as good as I hope, but um, uh, for me it was necessary uh, to try, to try uh, this uh, speak uh, in this uh, very fine and uh, beautiful uh, language, uh, English. And uh, I ask you a little tolerance. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions. Um, first, uh, thank you very much for all your work. Um, uh, first, for Ben Salem uh, Hamesh. Um, I, I mean, the act of the, the novels that I've read, uh, whether Majnun al-Hukum or Allama or, the, or those two specifically, um, and what it seems like this novel, um, the act of writing the novel is an act of translation from so many sources. I mean, the novels are almost Borgesian in amount. You have, uh, in Majnun al-Hukum, it's almost a novel in footnotes. There's so many different historical sources that are interweaved throughout the novel. What my, it's a very simple question, but what's the process of writing the, your novels from beginning to end? Uh, I know Majnun al-Hukum was more, or the, the English translation, the theocrat, um, uh, was, was more pastiche or more segmented, but uh, how do you work from reading the original texts and then coming up with the novel? What, what's your process on some level? Um, that's one question, and then for uh, Roger Allen, you mentioned Georges Jeannette and the, you know, the outside of the text, the blurbs and all things. I think those are really important translation. In, in some books, like we, we don't, in the translations, we see like Terry DeYoung and from Dartmouth College, but we don't see what was maybe written in the Arab text, like, like in Majnun al-Hukum, for instance, there was Juan Gotisolo's introduction, I think. Yeah. I, should that be more used more to actually understand the reception of a text in the Arab world in Morocco, or no? Or what's your opinion on that? I think the background is historical background. Of course. I can't uh, create a, a, a book uh, which uh, don't exist. Al uh, Alama, Ibn Khaldun, Had al Andalusi, what's the other? Al Muadibati? No, Muadibati, no. Zaharat al Jahiliya, Majnun al Hukm. It's necessary to, to, to see all this background. Huh? Without this, we, we, we can't write uh, nothing. Nothing. But there is another, another side. It's uh, about uh, present, present now, which uh, will be a past in the future, <laughs> of course. But uh, for me, it's necessary. Like Margaret uh, Yursunar, uh, the memories of Adrienne. Uh, like, uh, li like, uh, like uh, Umberto Eco, the name of Rose. Mm. Huh? Like Flaubert in Salambo, yeah. it is the, the, the first. The, 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 the first uh, uh, thing is to have 
knowledge about all this. Without this, we can't write nothing. Ex uh, uh, except uh, some ideas uh, uh, very, very uh, detached of uh, history. Huh? And uh, this, uh, for me, it, it was, uh, uh, I, I must, I must uh, do that. But in another side, we, we have a problem in unemployed, so much, unemployed. Unemployed. It, 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 is, it is an odd subject, more present, more, uh, it is an odd, an, an, another, another direction. Huh? We can, we must uh, say how uh, uh, sociology says, uh, history, social history, uh, but when you have a personality, historical personality, the, 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 to consult, all we have, well, we can uh, 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 read. And uh, this epoch, this character, it's very, 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 very necessary. Uh, and, uh, with this method, this way method, it was uh, very, very uh, old with, uh, uh, for all uh, historian, uh, specialist, uh, documents, uh, all uh, books uh, uh, written uh, about this epoch, about this uh, hero, or this uh, character. It's the same for uh, a novelist. Okay. Um, I would follow up on that by pointing out that um, the, the, no, I, I, I know, I, uh, in the post-2011 era, the, the notion of the explorations of the nature of power and corruption is not only a historical phenomenon. It reminds me of George Santayana, those who don't know history are condemned to repeat it. And I can, I can see basically, what, particularly uh, with Tolstoy, Tolstoy's War and Peace is a massive exploration of what historians didn't get oh, right. Yes. And there are whole chapters about, of that novel which are about writing history. But the, the, it's an interesting question about paratext. Because you see, that in a sense, your question is part of the problem. Because every time now, uh, I submit a translation to a press, it's sent out to readers in the target culture. And the blurbs on the back are almost always extracts from the reports which are written, which you hope are favorable. Therefore, it would be very nice, of course, to have opinions from the source text, but that's not part of the marketing strategy, marketing strategy in the target culture, which is in itself a, a problem with regarding the, the current situation regarding the, how translations are evaluated and then marketed. It's just that's the way things are. I mean, you know, I, I, I am guilty of having, I, I, I've retired from my university career now. I can spend my entire life writing blurbs. <laughs> I mean, I do spend half my time writing blurbs for other people, which is, you know, I get to read and stay in touch with what's going on, but. Uh, I'm, I'm frequently asked to read a text in order to write the blurb, and I think, well, no, maybe I wouldn't actually want to read this text, but here I am. But th that, that's one of the realities of uh, publication today, uh, particularly of translations. How yourself, when you translated this novel and the other novels, how, did you go back and read all of Ibn Khaldun too, or go back and actually look at all the historical texts that are mentioned and just study? I mean, how do you self, do you prepare yourself for a couple months, like a boxer before the translation? Is it that kind of, uh, or it's just a really slow process? Because it's, uh, I mean, I think, I think you mentioned, I just saw quickly that you said the word difficult, you mentioned in your speech. How do you confront the difficulty in a, I guess in a more micro level, I'm I don't, asking. Yeah, in, in the case of these novels, the very process of introducing unfamiliar cultural context required me to do a great deal of research. Um, and one of the narratives, one of the strategies of publication and translation, of course, is that almost all publishers refuse to allow you to have footnotes in the text. 
So this is where the, the dreaded glossary comes in. And uh, you'll notice that, that there are large glossaries to all these things because I assume that, perhaps arrogantly, that if I didn't know the particular phenomenon which was being discussed, then probably the, the reader of the English translation won't either. Yeah. So, um, yes, it, I won't say that, like Jamal, I once ran into Jamal Lahitani at a, at a, at a conference in uh, Holland, and he was writing, and I said, oh, are you writing your next novel? He said, no. He said, I'm practicing to write in the style of Ibn al-Arabi because his next novel was to be Kitab al where he indulges in pastiches of a particular, I mean, that's taking things to a certain level. No, I, uh, Professor Kennedy will know this. I uh, yes, I read extracts from Ibn Khaldun for the BA degree in Arabic at Oxford, but I did not go in and indulge in a wholesale reading process, although I did, in fact, have to go and look at Ibn Khaldun's Ta'rif because the whole section uh, of the meeting with Timur Lang uh, during the siege of Damascus is indeed founded on that particular account. Yeah. But after, after, after the to, to, to group and to remember and to, uh, to, uh, to have a knowledge uh, of all manuscript, all uh, texts from historians, the, 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 indeed, the, 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 the uh, works begins. What is the, these uh, works? The fiction. The fiction. For me, uh, George Zidane, it's very, very, very heavy, very, very, uh, no. And the, the trilogy of uh, Nagib Mahfoud is the same case. Huh? It, it's the, the, the first matters, but after that, the beginning, the, the, the work of a uh, novelistic begins. It's mm. a clear. Mm. There's no doubt that you had a great collaboration with Nagi Mahfouz, and, and there's no doubt that you have a, a wonderful collaboration and, and fruitful one with Ben Salim Hamish. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering what, at what level that collaboration exists. Obviously, it exists on the level of that, that enormous trust that must exist between you. Uh, for Ben Salem to trust you to to translate his novels, but uh, what what contact uh, exists between you and and especially creative contact during the process of the translation, if at all? Yeah. Or is it just that you take the manuscript and then you deliver it to? It's varied quite widely. In other words, taking the extreme example, May Telebisanius Dunya Z. She was there with the six translators for two weeks. And she would read through the Arabic texts, and then we'd all start yelling and screaming about what that meant and uh, would exchange views. So that was a direct involvement. Um, you may know that Jabra Ibrahim Jabra, the Palestinian novelist, poet, critic, musician, artist, everything, um, was a virtuoso translator of English literature into Arabic. His first two novels were written in English. Uh, and he's not the translator of them into Arabic. But um, we sent him chapters from his novel, Asafina, the first one we did. And he wrote back and said, and this is part of what I was saying about unidirectionality. He said, I translate from English into Arabic. I am not going to claim at all that I can translate Arabic into English. I tried to translate one poem of mine, which he did, or Kudi or Kudi Muhadi translated. He said, I don't like the English. It's not the same as my Arabic, and I, I wouldn't want to do that. I would I don't want to be responsible for a translation to English of something I wrote in Arabic. So he said, I have some suggestions, <laughs> lots of suggestions, about the interpretation of his Arabic text into English. But he said, you are the translators. 
And if you don't think that my suggestions are any good, then ignore them. But with most of the other people, I'm looking at my list here. Oh, Hanan. Hanan was very closely involved in the translation of, um, well, in Arabic, it's Hikayati Sharhan Yatul, which is, was probably the, the, the biggest time. It comes out in English as The Locust and the Bird. You want to talk about changing titles. That, again, is the author's choice of, of title because Bloomsbury, well, Bloomsbury, there's a, I, I could write a, a, probably a novel of my own about working on that particular text and the publication of it. Bloomsbury began by saying they didn't like the uh, third-person narrative, um, which is Hanan telling her mother's story in her mother's voice in the third person. So the, the, the text which has come out now has an epilogue and a prologue in the first person where Hanan introduces my translation with her own first person thing. And Bloomsbury thought that was much better. I th thought it was completely ridiculous. But um, she was very closely involved, partially because she showed me the letters, her mother's letters upon which she based some of it. But for example, Mahfouz, um, always acknowledged the translation once it was published, but he, he never uh, was involved in any way in the translation. Um, partially because he could read English, but his spoken English was not very good. But, oh, so there we are. Um, and um, most of the others have just left me to get on with it, frankly, and just been happy when it came out. For the suicide, the, 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 there isn't a problem suicide. It's a very human uh, question. When you have a chief of an enterprise and uh, her enterprise fell down, down maybe uh, her, though uh, her carry, mm. but another, another, uh, it, it is another motivation. For example, a resistant and to hands of a Gestapo. Mm. He must uh, do, uh, give all numbers of his another resistant. He has into his tongue cyanure. It is, yeah. it is, uh, it is a, a suicide for honor. And uh, there is a book of uh, uh, Emil Durkheim, his name is the suicide, the suicide. He says any, many, many motivations, motivation for this. And for me, there, mm. there isn't a problem for the, the title chosen by my uh, good friend <laughs> for this uh, novel. There, there isn't a problem. The prophet, no, it's, it's very uh, difficult uh, to say uh, <laughs> about it. Also, the, our prophet, uh, he knows a moment where the revelation caught. No revelation. He was very, very occupied, very uh, sad, sad after that. Huh? Uh, we, 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 haven't, we don't have uh, many time to explain myself about this question, but it's very normal, very normal. Uh, Harikiri uh, to suicide uh, for many, many uh, motivation, mm. it's very human mm. question. Roger Allen, just, just another one. Um, how do you, uh, what's your assessment actually of the tra literary translation uh, from um, from English into Arabic versus from Arabic into English. Uh, we all know Badr Shakir Sayyah who translated the S. Eliot and, and some of the literature and, and poetry that was translated from English into Arabic. So in your long experience in translation over the past five decades, how do, how do you see um, uh, both, both sides? Thank you. The honest answer is that I really don't consider myself capable of, of saying much about translation from English into Arabic. Um, 
Obviously, in my dealings in the other direction, I have participated in some projects um, such as the translation series published by the uh, Hail Amma al Kitab in, in Cairo, edited by Muhammad Ali Anani. Um, and I've also looked at some of the translations, particularly Jabra's translations. Jabra's translations are virtuoso exercises. I mean, Jabra translates Shakespeare's sonnets into Arabic poetry, which is a, a truly astonishing feat. Quite apart from his translations of the tragedies of Shakespeare. Um, but in general, uh, that, that is in fact really a separate field. And it goes back to my notion of unidirectionality, that uh, one, while I can talk about and boringly teach theories of translation, um, I only work actually on translations from Arabic and or French into English and not in the other direction. Because it, 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 it's, a, it's a whole different set of issues involved not least of which, of course, is that English is my native language. So that, that, that imposes a whole series of different kinds of problems. I'd like to ask you, Roger Allen, um, as a translator, you're unusual in my experience in being interested of, in theories of translation. Yes. What's much more common is a, a division between theorists of translation who write about translation as a, as a concept yes. and people who engage in it as a, as a practice and you're very unusual in, in, in broaching that divide and I, I was just wondering how far that you, you feel that might have affected your practice of, of, of translation how, how important that interest has been to you as a translator that's a, that's a wonderful question and the answer is I think it's had a profound effect. Uh, I would say now that the, the, the translators from Arabic to English, who I consider the most proficient, um, are all people who are becoming increasingly aware of the sophistication of translation studies as a, as a discipline in its own right. Uh, for example, uh, I mentioned Marilyn Booth. Marilyn Booth, like me, teaches a course on the theory of translation. And when you, when, when you get into discussion of translatability, whether it's Walter Benjamin or whether it's Eugene Nida or whoever it may be, and talk about the different phases of translation, then the, the, the process of applying it, for my purposes at least, is much more meaningful and much more significant because you're aware about some of the principles behind what you're doing. Uh, this goes back to, to a certain extent to what Marilyn Booth was saying, that the, the idea that translators are sort of hack people who translate by the word or the page or the hour or whatever is simply not the case. Uh, my wonderful, the, the, the best translator of Arabic poetry into English, uh, pre-modern Arabic poetry, is Michael Sells. And he used to be my colleague in Philadelphia. He's now at Chicago. But he would spend um, two months going over a single line again and again and again. And if you read his wonderful collection, Desert Tracings, Desert Tracings is the one book which has translations of early Arabic poetry that I want to give to anybody who was not in Arabic studies and therefore required to go through the torture of reading Arbery or somebody like that. There's a wonderful article in the first issue of the Journal of Arabic Literature quoting Shakespeare and heard great argument where uh, the teacher at Cambridge University takes some of Arbery's translations into a course at Cambridge University on English poetry. And he says, here's the new, you haven't seen this English poetry before. The student comments are astounding. The first of which is, is this poetry? So Arbery th thought he was translating into high Elizabethan verse, but it, it's like pulling teeth. And it's a, you can use it as a pony. But um, 
I think now to, tr to try to translate without an awareness of some of the theoretical background um, produces some of the results which are unfortunately available in print but really are not very good. So I found it massively useful, quite frankly. There isn't a question but a constatation. Uh, we have uh, together, we have the same uh, uh, hobby uh, or uh, passion for Abu Nuwas. Abu Nuwas, uh, th there is a good idea be behind uh, his uh, practice with, with uh, love for uh, wine. Because, why? Because he believes the, the life, uh, there isn't a meaning, nothing. He, he has a choice between two things, to do harakiri or to find solution in the wine. <laughs> it was uh, the disciple of uh, Dionysus in uh, uh, Greek history or Bacchus in uh, Roman history. Uh, to say the, the true is in wine. In uh, uh, vino veritas, and vino veritas. It was his choice, very res respectable. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it is for him to, to, to have a, to, to have a, a life better, uh, to have a, 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 a poetry with these, with these states. What do you think about this uh, um, hypothesis? About Abu Nuwas? Well, yeah. I, I, I personally feel that his wine poetry, um, which he wrote at the beginning of the ninth century, um, a lot of it, I mean, there's a huge diwan, or in his diwan, which is the biggest diwan of the classical period, mm -hmm. has a huge whole volume of, of wine poems. A lot of them are attributed to him. And they're not so good. But yeah. his, at, at his best, he was the most uh, eloquent of, of, of all poets that ever existed. Um, I think that he had different muses in his, in his inspiration uh, through wine. That, 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 some of them, that some of the poems are really pre pre do prefigure the, the use that the mystics, the Sufis, um, the use that they, they made uh, for, the, for wine as a symbol of intoxication, that meaning divine intoxication. At the other level, he was quite happy to be uh, confessional in his mode, really, and uh, admit to the sort of tawdriness of what happens at, uh, at night, at night um, when he got drunk with his friends. If he got drunk at all, I have one professor who taught me Arabic, Professor jo um, Matak, it's, who's now dead, actually, Mm -hmm. He said, well, he thought, well, perhaps wine in those days was like wine, you know. It's, it's like money in these days. If you have it, you don't really talk about it. So maybe he, he talked too much about it, mm. much more than he actually drank it. So he was much more of a, a, re a reflector about, about wine and, and what it meant in terms of inspiration, but different kinds of inspiration than he necessarily was a drinker, but I don't know. Now, I think what's important, actually, to the subject of translation is that Abu Nuwas is one of those poets who deserves to be translated mm -hmm. into English in full. Yes. Uh, I think all of Arabic poetry, in fact, all of Arabic literature should be, but I think Abu Nuwas is, I've said this before, but I think he's one of the most likable of poets because he's one of the most human mm -hmm. and the one that we identify with very easily mm -hmm. in all his different modes and moods and and manners of inspiration. Um, yeah, uh, But there was one thing, you know, one of the modes of wine, I can't, in 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 al Qaywani's in Raqiqa and Nadim's Qutb al-Surur fi al al Khumur, which was this compendium of wine, of Bacchic anecdotes and poetry, there's this idea that uh, when you drink, you roll out a carpet. And at the end of your session, you roll it back up so that no one can see what's <laughs> what <laughs> happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's, a, there's an element of that as well in him, when he's confessional. Although there's the paradox, of course, of, 
of the fact that he wrote these poems to be publicized. And one of his, one of his postures was always, um, do not be secretive if you can be open and, and candid. Let us give me a sirran. Let us give me a He and a number of others are great poets. Mm -hmm. We certainly share that passion, yes. I, I'm afraid we have to uh, draw it to a close, but thank you so much, both of you, for these wonderful presentations. Okay.